It's Sunday morning, you're still in bed, feeling almost nostalgic for the pandemic times when you never had to go anywhere, but then... And just like that, you have a deja vu. You remember your pre-pandemic life when you didn't know what an N95 was or carried disinfectant gel anywhere. And when you, every Sunday morning, got awoken by... The Witnesses! But why? Why do they do this? Why do they give up their weekend mornings to knock on people's doors? Like, I get Christians are all about converting people, but why did Jehovah's Witnesses decide going door to door to people's homes during the mornings was going to be the one way they would try to convert people? When I was a Jehovah's Witness, I believe we went door to door because the Bible said so. And I even believe that Jesus, the apostles, and all other early Christians went, like me, door to door to try to find converts. Little did I know, it had less to do with the Bible and more to do with Tupperware. When Charles Taze Russell started the movement, he had no idea that he was starting the Jehovah's Witness religion. In fact, he was against religion altogether after being disillusioned with it multiple times, and like any other guy in his early 30s disillusioned with religion, he started producing content. Except he couldn't ask people to subscribe to his YouTube channel back then. What you did instead of YouTube was write your own magazine and ask people to subscribe to that instead. And that's basically what Russell did. Between 1870 and 1879, he wrote multiple pamphlets and started selling this little periodical magazine called Science, Watchtower, and Herald of Christ's Presence. And he took off like the PewDiePie of religious pamphlets. So by 1886, when he publishes his first book, he already has a ton of tracks, pamphlets, and magazines to sell in a group of very devoted people who will pay anything to buy whatever Russell comes up with next. This is because Russell was kind of a genius in marketing and used very creative ways of advertising and selling his books. It was agreed there would never be any begging or petitioning for money. Which would lead him to basically create modern pre quarter cinema with the photodrama of creation in 1912 which he showed for free to sell its accompanying book knowing that no one would ever watch the entirety of the eight hours of this. And as part of his marketing efforts, he hired thousands of people to work as culprits, which is how you call back then people who sold religious propaganda for a living. Because that was the main thing Russell wanted. He wasn't gathering people into bi-weekly meetings. In fact, he wasn't gathering people at all unless it was to sell books. And he renounced the idea of religion until his religious movement ended up becoming a religion itself. Followers of Russell simply bought whatever he happened to have printed last and sometimes gathered to talk together about it. The only people going door to door were the culprits, who were basically Russell's full time paid door to door sales field workers looking to either sell books and subscriptions or indoctrinate other people to go out and sell books and subscriptions. And they were only one of many marketing tactics under Russell's belt. But then Russell dies and Rutherford takes over the religion and he immediately realizes that he's sitting on a gold mine of free work and decides that now everyone has to turn in a weekly report of how many hours they spend trying to sell the religion's publications. The culprits got the publications at 50% off so they could keep the other 50% of profit and spend more time selling books. The average witness, whom he called publishers, didn't have this discount, but they still needed to go canvassing trying to sell books as part of their worship. In 1921, Rutherford introduces the Auxiliary Culperter Service for people who couldn't work full-time and instead could only spend two hours per day or ten hours per week selling books and were also given a lower price on publications, giving witnesses sort of a part-time work option. By the end of the 20s, Rutherford was renaming a whole bunch of things in the religion. Although most people only remember him for renaming the religion itself from the Bible students into the Jehovah's Witnesses, he also renamed a lot of things inside the religion using military terms. He renamed congregations to companies, abolished the elder arrangement to instead organize witnesses into divisions, and regular and auxiliary culprits became pioneers and auxiliary pioneers, all according to God's will. That's what Rutherford said when he first institutionalized preaching in 1919. During the Cedar Point Convention, he said, A Christian's mission on earth is to proclaim the message of the Lord's kingdom of righteousness, which will bring blessings to the whole groaning creation. And how were they to proclaim the message of the Lord? Well, by selling subscriptions to his new magazine, The Golden Age, of course. When he returned to Cedar Point in 1922, he doubled and tripled down on the importance of selling his publications, asking full time workers directly to advertise, advertise, advertise the king and his kingdom. Advertise, advertise, advertise. 100 years of advertising the kingdom. 
And obviously, the key performance indicator for Rutherford was the hours that Jehovah's Witnesses spend canvassing. Measuring the time Jehovah's Witnesses spend door to door directly correlated with how the organization made money because that was time spent selling the organization's publications. The more committed a witness was, the more hours they would spend preaching and selling. Furthermore, a witness could show their commitment to God and their religion by leaving their jobs and starting a career in the full-time ministry, where they could become culprits or pioneers selling religious publications for a living. And all of these changes during the 20s resulted in pretty explosive growth. During the better part of the 20th century, people didn't have internet, so they were used to buying things from door-to-door -door salespeople like encyclopedias, magazine subscriptions, Tupperware products, and now even soul-saving books directly from God's mouthpiece. And Jehovah's Witnesses had the perfect hierarchical structure to sell them. It was an effective way to monetize their followers until 1990 when the U.S. Supreme Court decided to charge state sales taxes on religious items and books, which would mean that Jehovah's Witnesses would have to start paying taxes for every publication they sold. To avoid it, in a big brain move, they decided they would still sell and publish books, but they would no longer set a price for them, and instead ask for whatever the person wanted to donate. This, combined with the raise of popularity of internet sales, resulted in witnesses publishing all these books and magazines that nobody was allowed to subscribe to and pay for. But witnesses were still encouraged to go door to door and try to sell books for however much the other person wanted to give. The system was already broken. By the 90s, the world culture was already archaic, and the race of the internet ended up killing door-to-door -door selling, especially when it came to selling big and bulky books. But by now, the religion had been doing canvassing door-to-door for so long, it had already become a part of the religion. After all, Jehovah's Witnesses have been hearing for decades how selling publications door-to-door -door was the best way of preaching. No, the only way of preaching. It wasn't about becoming culprits and leaving off the books they sold anymore. It was about self-sacrifice of going door-to-door, -door, just like the people in the Bible. Because now, the Jehovah's Witnesses have spent decades trying to figure out which parts of the Bible they could use to motivate others to go canvassing. So, if it's God's will for people to spend dozens of hours per month canvassing to try to sell books warning about Armageddon, maybe that's what Noah did when he was building the ark in preparation for his own Armageddon. And once that thought is in the witnesses' radar, they'll put it through its constant regurgitation of information, quoting it over and over, until we get to the present day. Witnesses today fully believe that Noah preached to everyone around him that the end would come, but like nobody listened to him? Which is why nothing changed and nobody got saved? And isn't it like today when witnesses go door to door and people don't listen to them? Instead, the people were caught up in everyday affairs, eating, drinking, and marrying. Those were the things that concerned them. Now, if you're familiar with biblical narrative, you may remember how the Bible literally said that the people who died in the flood didn't even know about it until it started raining. But that's not in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Since spending time going door to door was so important, and since they decided their little made-up story about Noah preaching actually happened, when the time came to translating this verse for the Bible, they just changed it to something that sounded a little bit more vague so they could still believe that. After all, when you're translating your Bible and you already have a doctrine in mind, you can simply soften away the bits in the Bible that contradict your doctrine. Nowadays, Jehovah's Witnesses have all grown up with drawings like these, which show Jesus and the apostles going to people's houses to preach to them. Except that's as false as Noah's preaching. There are many Bible verses where Christians are told to go and convert people, but whenever it goes into specifics as to how that was to be done, Dr. Dr. Canvassing is, unsurprisingly, nowhere to be found. The main passage Jehovah's Witnesses use to justify their approach to preaching can be found in Matthew chapter 10, which, don't worry, we will not be reading. Here, Jesus gathers his 12 disciples and gives them the power of cleaning evil spirits, sort of like biblical ghostbusters, if you will, and sends them out to look for people off the roads in the main cities and perform miracles like curing the sick, raising up the dead, and do exorcisms. When the same story is recounted in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is registered as sending them two by two, which is why Jehovah's Witnesses go door to door in pairs. But this was clearly a one-time thing. Jesus wanted to spread the message that he was around and things were going to change, so he gave his disciples superpowers and sent them out to look for people to do magic tricks on. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus gathers 72 people to go ahead of him to every town and preach to the people there before Jesus arrived, sort of like hype men to warm up the crowds. And here is the only time Jesus mentions moving around from house to house. And he says, do not do that. Do not move from house to house. If I was as reductive as Jehovah's Witnesses, 
I'd just hold this piece of evidence as proof that Jesus is clearly against door-to-door -door canvassing, but that's obviously not what Jesus had in mind. Instead, Jewish hospitality dictated that foreigners in a town with no place to stay should be offered a meal and a place to spend the night. After all, there weren't any hotels back then, and foreigners couldn't just look for an Airbnb. Jesus is counting on this hospitality when he instructs the 72 people to not move around from house to house. Jesus wanted them to spend as little time arranging their accommodations as possible instead of spending time looking for better houses to stay at. That's how Jesus himself preached. He stayed at people's houses and went out to preach either at the temple or to the markets and other public places. People would get wind of where he was staying and would go look for him at that place too. That's why Martha was so busy cleaning her house while Jesus was preaching to the people inside, and why Jesus invited Martha to join them. The apostles went on to preach like that. Paul, for example, seemed to love staying at his friends Aquila and Priscilla's since they were all tent makers and preached to so many people that he always had a place to stay wherever he went. Just like Jesus, Paul also taught to the people he went to the house he was staying at and would preach to the people he was staying with besides preaching at the temple and public places. And that's what the Bible is talking about at the end of Acts chapter 5 and in the middle of chapter 20. Chapter 5 closes by saying, And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they continued without let up teaching and declaring the good news about Christ Jesus. And in chapter 20, Paul is registered as saying, while I did not hold back from telling you any of the things that were profitable, nor from teaching you publicly and from house to house. But Jehovah's Witnesses see the part that says house to house and wave it as proof that the Bible is clearly in favor of door to door canvassing. I'm not exaggerating. That's literally how they reply to the question, why do Jehovah's Witnesses go from door to door on their FAQ page? Taking those two verses out of context to pretend the Bible supports their canvassing efforts. As we've seen, this is clearly not referring to door to door canvassing. And the people writing this material know that. When you go to Acts chapter 20 in the Bible with references of the Jehovah's Witnesses and look into the references on the term house to house, they immediately open by saying that these weren't social calls or visits to encourage other Christians. And quote Dr. A.T. Robertson saying how, quote, the greatest preachers preached from house to house and did not make his visits merely social calls, unquote. They want witnesses to see that even outsiders like Dr. A.T. Robertson, who are experts on the Bible, agree with them that Paul basically went selling books door to door. Except I went to the actual book and looked up the quote. You know what the next sentence is? He was doing kingdom business all the while as in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. The writer clearly thinks Paul here is talking about how he stayed in house with friends and preached to them socially, which is why Jehovah's Witnesses are forced to take him out of context. Deep down, if you ask Jehovah's Witnesses why they preach door to door, they will only be able to give you these two verses that don't talk about preaching door to door. Because the third verse in the Bible that talks about preaching door to door is literally Jesus saying, don't do that. And in all of this biblical nonsense, they clearly ignore how preaching doesn't make sense anymore. The religion transitioned away from selling books and magazines decades ago. So the pioneers and publishers continued to go door to door, but with nothing to sell. And while now they can count the hours they spend working for free for the religion as part of the time they spend preaching, they're still expected to track the time they spend going door to door, even if the original reasons for doing so are long gone. Have you heard about the five monkeys experiment? It's a behavioral experiment with fascinating results, probably because it never happened, but I already have the analogy, so pretend you still think the experiment is real for a couple more minutes. The fake experiment says how they put five monkeys in a cage with a ladder and bananas at the top of it. However, every time any of the monkeys try to climb the ladder, the experimenter sprayed all five monkeys with cold water. Then the experimenter starts substituting monkeys one by one. Each time they introduce a new monkey, it tries to reach the bananas, but the monkeys prevent him from reaching them so they don't all get sprayed with cold water. That is, until the five original monkeys have all been swapped out. But despite none of them knowing from first experience how the not climbing the ladder rule came to be, they all still prevent each other from climbing it. This experiment may not be real, but it perfectly describes what happens with the witnesses. One day, one guy introduces a change into the religion. Then, if the change sticks, the witnesses will keep doing that thing and never stop because it's just what they've been doing all along. And I think preaching door to door perfectly encapsulates this vestigial doctrine issue. Jehovah's Witnesses were told for so long that preaching door to door to sell books was key for their salvation that they continue doing it, even when the books are long gone. What are they gonna do? Stop preaching? Stop counting hours? They've never done that. 
so they will prevent others from even surfacing that ridiculous idea, despite none of them knowing from first experience how preaching door to door came to be. They've been sprayed and gaslit for so long, they can't imagine a world where they don't preach like that. And none of them would even dare to think of ending the preaching system because they're afraid of God's punishment if they stop. Thank you so much for watching. I had this end joke where I asked for patrons and PayPal donations for weed money while saying that I'm not asking for donations, sort of as a way to mock the manipulative way that a watchtower asks for donations. As you know, for over 130 years, this organization has never solicited for fun, and it is certainly not going to start now. We in no way want to be categorized with other organizations, religious and otherwise, that coerce their supporters to donate. However, I thought it would be pretty funny. However, while I was recording this, Lloyd Evans literally did that, but unironically, and now I don't have a joke to end this video.